So for people that are overweight who are kind of averse to exercise, fidgeting might actually be a good entry point. And 800 to 2,500 calories is a considerable amount of calories when you really think about it. Now, I would be remiss and I'd probably come under a pretty considerable attack if I didn't just acknowledge up front a core truth of metabolic science and also of neuroscience, frankly, which is that calories in versus calories out, meaning how many calories you ingest versus how many calories you burn is the fundamental and most important formula in this business of fat loss and weight management in general. If you ingest far more calories than you burn, you're likely to gain weight. And a good portion of that weight is likely to be adipose tissue, fat. It's also true that if you ingest fewer calories than you burn, that you will lose weight and that a significant portion of that will come from body fat. A calorie is a calorie as a unit of energy. And we need to accept and acknowledge this calories in, meaning calories ingested versus calories burned formula. But the calories burned portion is strongly influenced by a number of things that you can control that can greatly accelerate or increase the amount of adipose tissue or the proportion of adipose tissue that you burn in response to exercise and food. If your foundation of health and your foundation of hormones and your foundation of metabolism isn't right, it's going to be very hard to get the most out of any kind of exercise or fat loss protocol. We should all be striving to get quality and sufficient sleep. Get your sleep right. Get your light exposure right. Avoid bright light in your eyes at times you want to be asleep and get bright light in your eyes at times you want to be awake. The other thing is essential fatty acids. We need fatty acids. They are vital to so many aspects of our health. You don't have to get them from supplements. You can if you want to, but you need to get them from your food. They are essential. The levels of fatty acids that will promote good mood and also healthy metabolism and will start to shift the needle in the right direction on bloodborne cardiovascular factors. The key thing is to get the levels of EPA that you ingest above 1,000 milligrams per day. So that doesn't mean just taking 1,000 milligrams or more of say fish oil or krill oil or whatever your preferred source is. It means getting above 1,000 milligrams of EPA, which may require that you ingest more essential fatty acids than just 1,000 milligrams per day. As well, for people who have cravings issues, they, they crave sweets all the time. People who are craving sugar can satisfy that sugar craving by giving the neurons, so to speak, what they actually want, which are amino acids and essential fatty acids. That includes EPA, but also things like glutamine, an amino acid that can really reduce sugar cravings if you take a teaspoon of that or even a tablespoon of that a few times a day. Finally, you can't really position yourself to have a strong metabolism if your iodine levels aren't correct and your thyroid levels aren't correct. The best ways to support the thyroid system and metabolism in general is to make sure you're getting enough selenium, sometimes called selenium, each day. Simple way to do that is to ingest the highest concentration of selenium food that I'm aware of, which is Brazil nuts. One or two or three of those per day, you'll have more than enough selenium uh, to meet the thyroid needs. So again, sleep, sufficient EPAs, Glutamine, if you have issues with leaky gut or sugar cravings can really help. Get your gut microbiome right. I may have uh, missed saying that, but get your gut microbiome right. That does not necessarily mean you need to ingest probiotics. You can if you want to, but you can also just simply ingest a serving or two of fermented foods per day. That can greatly assist. So things like sauerkraut, kimchi, every culture has a different um, source or sources of fermented foods. Those can really help the, the gut microbiome and then make sure that your thyroid hormone is supported through the ingestion of sufficient iodine, not too much and sufficient selenium, not too much. That sets the basis for how things like exercise cold and some of the compounds and other things that we're going to talk about today that are, I'm guessing, truly going to be truly new to many of you that can really increase the burn factor in the equation of calories in versus calories b burned. The burn factor, your thermogenic environment is one of the, if not the most important factors in this business of fat loss. And since I'm a neuroscientist, that's what we're going to talk about. Let's talk about how fat is converted into energy, which is 
is sometimes also called fat burning. There's two parts to this process. One is fat mobilization. And the second is fat oxidation or utilization. You just have to move that fat out of the position that it's in. You have to get it out of the fat cells, all right? It can be visceral around our viscera, our organs, or it can be subcutaneous under our skin. Most people are thinking about subcutaneous fat when they think about fat. So the first step is to get those fatty acids moving around in the bloodstream, to get them out of those fat cells. And then they can travel and be used for energy. And that second part, remember, first part is mobilization. The second part is oxidation, is then those fatty acids, those are potential fuel. They're just potential fuel, but you haven't burned the fat yet. You've just moved it out of your fat cells. They're going to go into cells that can use them for energy. And once they are inside those cells, they're still not burned up. You need to oxidize them. I think oxidation is the burn up part. They need to be moved into the mitochondria and then they can be converted into ATP, into energy. Mobilize the fat, then you have to oxidize the fat. You have to, in other words, you have to mobilize it, then you actually have to convert it into energy. If you just mobilize it and you don't convert it into energy, you don't oxidize it, it can be returned to body fat. And many of the things that the nervous system can do is to increase the mobilization of fat, but also the oxidation of fat. Okay, so let's talk about how to activate the nervous system in ways that it promotes more liberation, movement, mobilization of fat, and more oxidation of fat. So one of the most powerful ways to stimulate epinephrine, which is also called adrenaline, from these neurons that connect to fat and to thereby stimulate more fat mobilization and oxidation is through movement. But I'm not talking about exercise. The type of movement that I'm referring to is extremely subtle. And some of you may be familiar with this type of movement, which is that shiver or shivering is a strong stimulus for the release of adrenaline, epinephrine into fat and the increase in fat oxidation and mobilization. But shiver is not just induced by cold, and there are other subtle forms of movement that can greatly increase fat metabolism and fat loss. There was a group in England during the 1960s and 70s that discovered a pathway by which subtle forms of movement can greatly increase fat loss. We found where people that overeat but don't gain weight as a consequence, and in fact, many people who had low levels of body fat had a lot of resting tremor, not of the Parkinsonian type, but they would bounce their knee while they were sitting. When they would talk, they would engage in very angular movements. They were sort of electric. They found that they greatly increased their weight loss anywhere from 20 to 30% increases. And in some cases, you know, there are the, always those few people who burned a lot more. It seems to work best in people who are already slightly overweight. So for people that are overweight who are kind of averse to exercise, fidgeting might actually be a good entry point. And 800 to 2,500 calories is a considerable amount of calories when you really think about it. Now, shivering is almost always associated with cold. And there are two ways that shivering can increase fat loss, but you have to do it correctly. And most of the people that are using cold are suggesting the exact wrong protocol. In fact, the one I'm going to recommend is 180 degrees in the opposite direction to the typical protocol that you'd hear about. When you get into cold and you shiver, the shivering, those that low level movement of the muscle, those small movements, triggers the release of a molecule called succinate. And succinate acts on the brown fat to increase brown fat thermogenesis and fat burning overall. It actually increases body heat through this brown fat thermogenesis pathway. How much cold exposure and how often, that's the key. Remember, if you resist the shiver, you are not going to get the increased metabolic effect because you are not going to get the succinate release. So how many times a week do you need to expose yourself to cold will depend on how much fat you're trying to lose and how much you're trying to increase your metabolism. There are studies that describe positive effects on fat loss of exposing yourself to cold either through cold shower 
or through ice bath or other cold water. It doesn't have to actually have ice in it, provided it's cold enough. For any time, anywhere, excuse me, between one and five times per week. But it turns out that just one exposure per week can be valuable. The question then is how long to get into that cold environment and how cold should that environment be? It turns out that if you want to trigger the shiver, what you want to do is to get into the cold and then get out of the cold and typically not dry off and then get back into the cold and out of the cold. That will definitely stimulate more shivering than just getting into the cold itself. So what I'm not referring to is getting into the cold environment like an ice bath and waiting until you shiver and staying there shivering. So here's a potential kind of sets reps protocol that you can play with. Find a temperature that induces shiver for you. That's going to vary depending on your cold tolerance and how cold adapted you are. One to three, maybe five times a week. Get in until you, or get under the shower or whatever it is, until you start to shiver, genuinely shiver. Then after about a minute or so, get out, spend one to three minutes out, but don't dry off. Get back in for anywhere from one to three minutes, but try and access the shiver point again. And you might do three repetitions of that. So it's three times in and three times out total, okay? That's a great starting place. And what you don't want to do is build up your tolerance to cold so fast that pretty soon you're able to resist the shiver because remember the shiver is the source of the succinate release that will trigger brown fat thermogenesis. Next, I'd like to move to exercise and how particular timing and types of exercise can vastly improve fat loss. The topic of exercise is a kind of controversial one, not as controversial as nutrition and diet, which we will talk about in a few minutes. But it's a particularly interesting one because different types of exercise engage the musculature of the body and the heart and the lungs in different ways and can have vastly different effects on things like hormones and metabolism, depending on whether or not it's of high intensity, moderate intensity, or low intensity. So rather than think about weight training versus cardiovascular exercise, I think the most simple way, the most fluid way to have this conversation about exercise and fat loss is in terms of three general types of training. And those are high intensity interval training, so-called HIIT, H-I-I-T, sprint interval training. So that's gonna be very high intensity or SIT or moderate intensity continuous training, M-I-C-T. So we've got HIT, SIT and MICT, M-I-C-T. Let's ask the question that I think many of people are wondering about, it, which is, is it better, meaning do you burn more fat if you do your exercise fasted? At a period of about 90 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, I wanna be clear, after, at about or after 90 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, there's a switchover point whereby if you ate before the exercise, you will reduce, excuse me, you will burn far less fat from the 90 minute point onward than you would if you had gone into the training fasted. So let me repeat that. If it's moderate intensity, so-called zone two cardio type exercise, at the 90 minute point, if you happen to have eaten before the exercise within one to three hours prior to the exercise, then you reduce the amount of fat that you will burn from 90 minutes onward. Whereas if you had fasted prior to the exercise, you hadn't eaten anything for three hours or more prior to the exercise, at the 90 minute point, you will, 90 minutes of exercise, you will start to burn more fat than you would had you eaten. Now, 90 minutes of moderate intensity exercise is a lot. Now, there are also studies that point to the fact that you don't have to wait to 90 minutes in order to get this enhanced fat burning effect. If one does high intensity training or or even the very high intensity forms of training like sprints or squats or deadlifts or any kind of activity that can't be maintained for more than these, you know, eight or I would say up to 60 seconds. So a set of lifting weights repeated, repeated. If that's done, for anywhere from 20 minutes, so weight training or power lifting or these kinds of things or kettlebell swings or up to 60 minutes, well then the switchover point in which you can burn more fat if you go into that fasted comes earlier. 
because there's nothing holy about the 90 minute point for medium intensity zone two cardio. That 90 minute point is the point in which the body shifts over from mainly burning glycogen and realizes this is going on for a while. I'm going to shift over to a storage site fuel that is in reserve like body fat. It's this is going to happen for a while. So I'm going to start tapping into body fat stores. Now, fat doesn't have a little brain there. It is innervated by neurons, but it doesn't have thoughts. And you don't actually control this switch with your mind. This is something that has to do with the milieu of various hormones. What has to happen is insulin has to go down far enough. So if you ate before the exercise, you'd have an increase in insulin. If you ate carbohydrates, you'd have a bigger increase in insulin. Fat and proteins indeed will have lower amounts of insulin and fasting will give you the lowest amount of insulin. Well, then that switchover point is gonna come earlier in the exercise. And if you think about it, if you were to do something high intensity for 20, 30, 40 minutes, so maybe lift weights and then get into zone two cardio, if you were fasted, the literature says that you're going to burn more body fat. This could be distilled into a simple protocol whereby three or four times a week, you do high intensity training followed by either nothing or followed by low intensity training, especially if you're able to do that fasted. There are things that people can ingest that will allow them to oxidize more fat. And that occurs mainly by increasing the amount of epinephrine that is released from neurons that innervate fat tissue. One of the more common ones is one that you may already be using, which is caffeine. Caffeine for burning more fat, for oxidizing and mobilizing more fat is an interesting one. It can be effective at dosages up to 400 milligrams. And indeed that will lead to increased fat oxidation. It will do that because you will release more epinephrine and adrenaline. What are some of the other things that are, are useful and interesting? Well, in terms of tools that are actionable and have reasonable safety margins, I've talked before about uh, something called GLP-1. This is something that uh, can be triggered by the ingestion of yerba mate, which is a tea. GLP-1 is in the glucagon pathway. Mate increases GLP-1 and yes, increases the percentage of fat that you'll burn. It increases fat burning. And that is especially true, it turns out, from the scientific literature, if you ingest mate prior to exercise of any kind. So if you want to burn more fat, drinking mate before exercise is good. And there's one more compound that I think we should discuss in terms of increasing fat loss, and that's carnitine or acetyl L-carnitine. They lie in the same pathway. We can return to our basic knowledge now of fat mobilization and oxidation after fat is mobilized and makes it into cells and needs to be oxidized, that is accomplished and is facilitated by the presence of glucagon being elevated. GLP increases that process and insulin being low. L-carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine in particular facilitates fat oxidation it con helps convert fatty acids into ATP. And indeed, supplementing L-carnitine can increase fat loss. That's been shown. 